In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. It's good to hear. Truly is the original Greek translation. I was at a banquet last night. Half the, the room said indeed, the other half had truly. I kept yelling louder every time. Truly! <laughs> Trying to make that point. This Sunday, the first Sunday after Pascha, we always remember Thomas the twin, Doubting Thomas. And I like to think that part of why we do this is that this particular story is a story for us as the faithful. I'll unparse that as we go along here. Now this year I had an interesting experience and this uh, started Lazarus Saturday. So we're actually going back two weeks ago. So of course the story of Lazarus Saturday is that Jesus is about to enter Jerusalem for Palm Sunday and he is in the suburb of Bethany. And his friend Lazarus has died and has been buried and has been buried for a number of days. And he comes and raises Lazarus from the dead. But he has been in this process of coming to Jerusalem with the disciples. And he has told the disciples, and they don't always seem to understand this, that what's going to happen is he will be captured, put under trial, and crucified. He always says, and in three days I will rise. But the disciples don't ever seem to hear that. And they get all agitated about him dying. What I heard and it's amazing that you can go years and years and years and years reading the same Gospels and you miss details. Just before Jesus and the disciples are entering Bethany to do this healing, Thomas, who we commemorate today, makes this statement. I'm terrible about this. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. But he's speaking to the other disciples. And he basically says something to the effect of, Let's follow him to our death. They do have this understanding that they're not welcome in Jerusalem. They do have this understanding that the authorities in Jerusalem, the Jewish authorities, are looking to do harm to Jesus. And he has, in the past, narrowly escaped getting into physical harm. So it's this very puffed up, well, let's all go to our deaths sort of thing. What do we see unfold on Holy Friday? Who's at the cross? The myrrh bears, St. John the beloved disciple, but everybody has ran off and hid because they've witnessed firsthand that their beloved teacher was grabbed by those in authority, taken into custody, beaten, tortured essentially, and then suffers this horrific public execution. So there is a guilt by association there. We were his disciples for three years. What if somebody doesn't, you know, looks at us the wrong way? We could be next. So we hear the beginning of this gospel story and it's taking place on that first Sunday. We hear the disciples are in the upper room with the doors locked. They're still gathering and meeting. They're still in Jerusalem. But they're hiding. And they're concerned about their safety. The door's locked. We hear Thomas is not there. And how it's explained is that Thomas was so afraid he was hiding somewhere else alone. And think of what we have been told about that first Sunday. Of course, the myrrh bearers, they go to the tomb to finish the task of embalming the body. And they discover that the tomb is open and that it's empty. There is no body. But they encounter an angel that says, well, he's risen, like he said he was going to be. Go tell the disciples. And it's interesting, in the Gospel of Mark, it says they leave and there's this element of fear. They're afraid that they found an empty tomb. And they spoke to an angel. 
And we hear that they do go and they find the disciples and they say, the tomb's empty. An angel told us he's risen. And we hear, of course, first century uh, Palestinian men. Well, that's just women talk. They're hysterical. But we hear that Peter and John, the beloved the disciple, they go to the tomb likewise. And they discover it's empty, raising a question mark for them. And it's only after we hear that, that we hear that Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. And at first she doesn't recognize him. So that's a key piece there. The women were the last ones standing at the foot of the cross. And the woman was the first one to see the risen Lord. That's the chaos of that first Sunday. So, of course, as we hear, the disciples are in the upper room. Jesus appears, even though they're in a locked room. He says, peace be to you all. He's there. They have a conversation. And then after that, the disciples see Thomas. And they speak to him and they say, hey, he appeared. He, he did rise. He appeared to us. And Thomas says, well, until I see the nail prints in his hand and I can touch those, and the wound in his side where the centurion stuck him with the spear, unless I can touch that, I am not going to believe. Have that juxtaposition. Hey, disciples, let's all go to our deaths in Jerusalem with Jesus. That he says, you know, earlier. And now it's, I won't believe unless I actually physically touch those wounds myself. So he's given that opportunity. So the Sunday after that first rising, the rising, not the first, it's not like he rose multiple times. After he rose, which would be today in this liturgical chronology, again, the apostles are gathered in the upper room. Again, the door is locked. This time, Thomas is with them. And Jesus appears and he greets them. Peace be to you. And then immediately he turns to Thomas. He says, hey, Thomas, here you go. Touch the wounds. Touch, you know, put your hand on my side. It's really me. And then Thomas has the response. My Lord and my God. The switch flipped for him. He really did rise. This really is him. And I get what this is all about. Jesus then makes this statement. It's about, well, you saw and you believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and believe. Well, who's that? That's us. We did this Pascha service. We did all these things leading up to this Pascha service last week. And of course, the element of that is that there is all of this hymnody that we sing. And there's the benefit of hindsight in a lot of that hymnody, saying this is what's happening, this is what it means. It's running commentary on the event, looking backwards. It's not like that first Sunday where the apostles are like, he's dead, we buried him, we don't know what's going on, we heard this weird story, we don't know what's going on, and it's chaos and it's messy. We have that service, but I know that often in our day-to-day -day life, it's messy and chaotic, like Thomas. One day, with respect to our faith, we can say, sure, let's all disciples run off to our deaths and you know, support Jesus Christ. And then other days, we're like, I got to see the hands. I got to put my hand, my hand in his side. And sometimes we can say, my Lord and my God. It's messy for us because our experience changes over time. That's why I say this is our Sunday. Because that, that line, blessed are those who have not seen and believe, is for us. So what do we do about those ups and downs in our faith and the messiness? 
Well, I think in part it does point back to what I said about all that hymnody we sang on Pascha. The structure of the church is to be essentially that peg that you can hang your hat on. And so things like coming to the Pascha service and fully participating, that's something that bolsters your faith. We can meditate on all of those hymns. We can consider the divine drama as it's unfolding in that liturgy. And know that that story is our story individually. And we share that story as a community together. There's a point that was made that, you know, during the, the Orthros service before liturgy, we always read the Synoxarium, which is basically what, it, what uh, uh, you know, today in history, as it were, what is this day about? And one of the things that they said in the Synoxarium this morning was, this particular Sunday is the day that it was established that every Sunday in light of Pascha, we celebrate as the resurrection. And so that's why, you know, priests talk until they're blue in the face. You should be in church every Sunday at a divine liturgy because it points at Pascha. And again, it's one of those things that bolsters your faith. Something you can hang your hat on. You come to church, you get recharged. That doubting, I have to see the hands and, you know, put my hand in the side. You have a measure of that given to you. And you can go out and say, yeah, I do believe this. This is important. This affects my life positively. Part of that doing it together. I know that one of the difficulties, this is something I struggle with a lot as, as the parish priest. I know you're all busy folks. You have jobs where you work. 50, 60, in some cases 70 hours a week. And it can feel like you're running from one thing to the next. And sometimes it feels like all you have time for is to come to church, do what we do here, get communion, and then leave. But I know that part of this, having a peg and something to hang your hat on, is doing the journey together. And so the more that you can develop relationships with your fellow parishioners, the more you can share those struggles with one another. I know there's a practical aspect of why we have coffee hour. The traditional practice of the Orthodox Church is that we don't eat before communion. It's midnight until after you receive communion is the traditional practice. So the practical thing of why Orthodox parishes have coffee hour uh, John's real good about this. I say coffee hour. I'm used to coffee hour. This throws me a little bit. John always says breakfast. Well, you know, it's my Sunday to bring breakfast. And I'm kind of like, well, we're not having scrambled eggs and sausage, and that's kind of weird. But if you look at the word and the roots, break fast. You're breaking the fast. That's kind of a practical thing. But there's also this element. That is a time when we can connect with our fellow parishioners, bear one another's burdens, understand as Thomas did, there are those times. I'm putting my hand, you know, I need to see the hands here. And you can talk with other parishioners. And they can tell stories of, I put my hands in the prints. I put my hands in the side. I have a strong faith over here. How can I help you, lead you through this period as well? There's that aspect as well. So we have come to this second Sunday of Pascha, the first Sunday after Pascha, where we look at the story of Thomas. It's a messy story, but we've been given the church to help us work through that messiness together. Christ is risen. Truly he is risen.